that uh, when the day comes, that everybody can be there, but certainly your speakers. And so be praying for those that will be leading our women's retreat. Uh, that's coming pretty soon. Also want to mention to you that the week of the 20th through the 24th, I would ask that you be in prayer. I'll be uh, having a Hispanic family come out for a visit, and I'll be showing them around at some of the opportunities we have with our Hispanic work. And so I'll uh, be praying for the Vargas family and whether or not God might be leading them to Idaho, and that would be later this month. Don't forget that Secret Church is an uh, evening of, of teaching on the book of Ruth this year, and it takes place on April the 19th. And uh, it's one of my favorite events of the year, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet signed up for it, uh, be sure you do that today. You can stop by the Connections uh, uh, counter out there and add your name to it. Remember, if you want a study guide, you'll have to sign up in the column that asks for that. And if you just want to come for free and attend the event, that's in the other column without the study guides. And I don't have the current total of study guides have been asked for, but I have a limit to how many I have. So the sooner you sign up, if you want a guide, the better. But that event, our study in the book of Ruth, will be April the 19th. I wanted to announce that we will be having a business meeting at the end of this month. So the last Sunday night at six o'clock, we'll have a meeting where we'll be considering uh, whether or not we're going to call David Pryor as our full-time youth pastor. So you'll want to mark that on your calendars as well. And then I also want to remind you, if you're a guest in our service today, there is a tear-off card, our connection card. That's a card that you can fill out and turn in at the back of the room in one of the wooden stands at the end of the aisles. That's where we place our tithes and our offerings and, and our prayer cards and, and whatever. Uh, as you look at the back of that card, that's a, the place where it goes. And wanted to remind you to fill that out and please turn that in today. And then inside the bulletin, uh, you'll notice that uh, this is the month that we're going to be lifting up the nation of Iraq. And... Um, uh, would point out to you, if you'll look on their 0.3% Christian. And uh, that number has decreased in recent years um, with all the things that have happened there. I mean, with, with ISIS and, and many of our brothers and sisters in faith were uh, uh, slaughtered and displaced at that time. Almost, you know, a, a huge part of the <clears throat> Christian, Christian presence in that country uh, was forced out. So we want to pray for our brothers and sisters there. And one of the things that I noticed in the paragraph that I happen to be looking at, it says their day-to-day -day life is focused on survival. Uh, that's not how we live our lives. That's how they live theirs. And so they desperately need us to remember them in prayer. And so I hope that you'll take your little insert and put it maybe on your refrigerator or somewhere you, where you'll be thinking about praying for them throughout this month. And that will be the nation that we're going to focus on uh, this week. And I did realize on Easter Sunday that because I'm still having to sit down, I can't always see your face. Depends on wh where you're sitting. So I apologize for that, but eventually I'll get uh, back on my feet. Let me ask Brandon to lead us in prayer. Jesus, we just thank you for this morning that we can gather together as a family to worship you or to sing praises to you, to hear your words spoken and preached to us, Lord. Lord, we just ask that as we lift our songs to you this morning, that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. Lord, that you would be the focus of our lives, of our minds, of our hearts, of everything we do, Lord. And it's Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may stand. of redemption, stories of hope, heaven awakened inside my soul. And I sing in Christ alone, my solid ground, amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound, on that rugged cross, Jesus paid it all. Cause he lives, this is my song. He's like a river, love so divine. And those words kept singing through the darkest nights. 
sweet hymns of freedom and thumbs of praise remind my heart to trust his name in Christ alone my solid ground amazing grace oh how sweet the sound on that rugged cross Jesus paid it all because he lives this is my is my song praising the Savior all the day long blessed assurance glory divine oh hallelujah Jesus is mine this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long Blessed assurance, glory divine. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. In Christ alone, my solid crown. Amazing grace, oh, how sweet the sound. On that rugged cross, Jesus paid it all because he lives this is my soul in christ alone my solid ground amazing grace oh how sweet the sound on that rugged cross jesus paid it all because he lives this is my soul This is my soul, and because He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is and because I know He holds the future and life is worth living just because He Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain Lost in white as Sin had left a 
absence they may lost your body By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We're going to teach you a new song this morning called The Same God. This song has been stuck in my head constantly for the last few weeks. The chorus says, Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. And it goes on later on in the song, talking about the things that God did in the past, that he is still able and willing to do those for us today says, you heard your children then, you heard your children now. 
You answered prayers back then and you will answer now. God, you're providing then and you're providing now. You moved in power then, God, move in power now. You were a healer then, you are a healer now. And then it says, you were a savior then, and Lord, you are a savior now. The things that God did in the Old Testament and the New Testament, those things he can still do for us today. He saved back then, one of my favorite lines in here, he saved back then, and today he is saving. And today, if you haven't heard the gospel of Christ, if you don't understand what Jesus did for you, our prayer is that today is the day that you choose to follow him. We're going to sing through this chorus together, and if you know it, sing it with us. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Sing it again. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me. God, my God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face the light But I've got my own giants Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were providing then, you are providing. Say
same thing you did then that you do now, Lord. Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you healed back then, and Lord, you heal today. Lord, we thank you that you saved then, and Lord, even today, you are saving souls. Lord, move in our lives today. Lord, may we not be the same when we walk out of here as we were when we came in. Lord, speak to our hearts. May we be about your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before you sit down, let me give you a moment to find someone to say hello to. We'll give you about two minutes to do that. Hello. All right, if you'll find your seat. As you're taking your seat, you'll notice that you have a listening guide inside your bulletin to help you follow along with the message. And I would like to ask if you would go ahead and be turning to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews.
It was Palm Sunday back in 1988 when Roger Haber, who at that time was the pastor of Bridgeway Community Church in Carroll Streams, Illinois, received a phone call from his son's doctor. At that time, he and his wife had a small child. And the doctor was encouraging them to immediately go and consult with a pediatric neurosurgeon at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. As you can imagine, the next few hours uh, were full of anxious thoughts and silent prayers as they made their way to see the doctor. After a series of consultations, uh, Roger's wife and the little boy were carried away so they could do tests on him, and they left Roger uh, sitting there in the waiting room. As Roger sat there, he couldn't help but think to himself how many times he had been sitting with families that had been in similar situations. And that's when this thought kind of went through his mind. Where's my pastor? And no sooner had that thought, you know, left his mind than this passage of Scripture that you and I are going to be looking at flooded his mind. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet he was without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Father in heaven, as we think about that passage of Scripture, we're grateful for in that moment when Roger was asking questions, you came to him through the word. You spoke into his heart and, and gave him confidence as he faced the situations with his family that confronted them on that day. I thank you that whenever we do cry out that you find ways to communicate to us, and I thank you for all the times when you have reminded us of your promise. So Lord, as we turn our attention here today, I pray that you would speak to us again through your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to know, as Roger sat there, he had another thought. He thought to himself, I'm not alone. Even though I feel like I'm all alone, I'm really not alone because my heavenly pastor is right here with me today, and he knows exactly how I feel, and he knows exactly what I need. Now, there are those who think that that's pretty hard to believe, that Christ would be able to understand their circumstance. In fact, some people are thinking, you know, how, how could he possibly understand what it's like to have a child that's facing a serious health crisis? Or how could Christ understand what it's like to go through a divorce or to be bullied at school or a, a hundred other things? Well, I'm going to tell you how he can know. Because we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens and came down to earth where he was incarnated in a human body just like ours. Oh, yes, Jesus Christ does know what it's like. In fact, when you think about it, you'll remember that Jesus Christ knew exactly what it was like to lose a loved one. Remember that occasion when he wept outside the grave of one of perhaps his very best friends. And Jesus certainly knew what it was like to, uh, you know, to be rejected. In fact, I was reading in John chapter 6 this week, and in verse 66, it tells us that there were literally hundreds of people who turned away from Jesus Christ because from their perspective, his words required more of them than they were willing to give. And Christ knew what it was like to be mocked by those who thought he was a madman, who knew what it was like to be unjustly tried by those who hated him. When you and I remember his earthly existence, we know that he experienced hunger and thirst. He was tempted and tried. He even tasted death so that you and I could taste life. So I want to tell you today that I think he knows. In fact, he not only knows, he, he understands and he cares about us. And best of all, he is beckoning us to come into his presence and into the very throne room of God itself with confidence. Many years ago, a movie came out called One Night with the King. Is anybody familiar with that movie? A few of you are. One Night with the King. It was, it was based on a story that's found in the Bible. It was based on the story of Queen Esther. And of course, that story is found in that Old Testament book by her name. 
Now, as the story unfolds, or as the uh, you know, text unfolds, we discover that Esther's people are in big trouble. Remember who our people are? They're the Jews. She's Jewish. And um, they're in great danger because a man by the name of Haman who hates them has convinced the Babylonian king to put him to death. And so Mordecai, who's Esther's uncle and guardian, he's raised her since she was a child. He, he makes his way into her, uh, you know, into her company where he begins to plead with Esther to stand up for her people, to do something about it, and to go and, and speak to the king who happens to be, does anybody remember? Her husband. Now, at first, Esther's not sure about this because she knows that to, to go into the presence of the king without being summoned would mean your death. I mean, that's just the way it worked back then. But Mordecai wouldn't give up. Kept on pleading with her. And finally, he said something that many of you will remember because uh, as much as anything, this is one of the things we remember out of this book. He said to Esther, he said, who knows, but maybe you've achieved royalty for such a time as this. Well, Esther finally decides, if I die, I die. I'm going to do it. And so she asked for her people to join her in a period of prayer and fasting before she would go to see the king. Now, this is where it gets Hollywood all of a sudden, because you know in a Hollywood movie, you know, anytime things aren't going well or, you know, there's a tragedy going on, there's usually a storm outside. So that's the setting at this moment in the story. In the movie, it's pouring down rain just like it was here the other day. And so when she goes to see the king, she, uh, she barges into the very throne room itself. She is dripping wet. And of course, the, uh, you know, the bodyguards for the king, they rise to their feet. All eyes turn to the king to see what he's going to do. And if you want to know the rest of the story, you'll have to read it for yourself. I tell you that because I want you to know how different it is for you and me. Because you and I are being invited into the very throne room of heaven itself. And when you and I go there, uh, we don't go with fear. We go with confidence. In fact, we've been invited to come with boldness into his very throne room itself with all of our petitions. And friends, that's no matter how great or how small they may be, we're invited to come after all. Are we not God's children? Take a look at this verse of Scripture. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. In fact, this is one of those promises you may want to underline or highlight in your Bible. For John writes and says, As many as received him... And by that, he's talking about Jesus Christ. In other words, as many as received Christ, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. So at the time that John was writing, he's talking about the ones who had already confessed their faith. But he went on to say, even to those who believe in his name, and that's the part of the promise that reaches out to you and me. Even to those like us, who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. I wanted to remind you of that passage of Scripture so that I might remind you of this, that as the children of God, you and I have all of the rights and privileges that come with being a part of that family, and that includes the privilege of being able to step into the very throne room of heaven itself in our prayers and be heard by the king of the universe. Amen? We have that privilege. By the way, I'm wondering how many of you took advantage of that privilege before you came into the house of the Lord today. I did. I, I, I did it the same way I do every morning. I started off in the quietness of uh, my favorite room in the house where I spent some time with my king. In fact, let me show you another prayer promise. John 16, verse 24. John 16, verse 24. Christ is speaking to his disciples, and he makes this statement. He said, until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. And even though Christ said that long ago, I want you to know the sentiment is still the same today because we are being invited to come boldly before God's very throne 
of grace, where you and I will receive two things, mercy and grace, the twin sisters of God's benevolence. I made that one up myself. I thought about it because when I was thinking about the last time I'd been in Africa, everybody's name was kind of like that, mercy and grace and, and peace and hope and joy. I mean, those, that was their names. In fact, uh, the first time I went, my interpreter's name was Talk More. And he did that week as he helped me to talk. That was really his name, Mercy and Grace. In fact, let's think about the first one, Mercy. Mercy means getting what we do not deserve. And if you and I think about it, every one of us in this room and everyone who may be listening at home, we all deserve God's judgment and his wrath because every single one of us have disobeyed and disregarded God's plan for our lives at one time or another. That's what we deserve. But God wants us to have his mercy. And friends, if it were not for his mercy, you and I would be in big trouble, not only in this life, but certainly in the one to come. You know, as a boy, I began to better understand the teachings in the Bible about my soul and the price that would have to be paid because of my sin. And I want you to know it scared me to death. In fact, I might say it this way. It scared the life into me if you know what I mean. In fact, some of you out there, you know somebody who needs to have the life scared into them. Thank goodness for God's mercy. Let me show you this passage of Scripture. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. You find chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Now, some might think that I'm asking you to look at a parable. Remember what a parable is. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and a personal application. No, this isn't a parable. This is the real deal. Christ is talking about two real men. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was what? A tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. That may be the part of the verse you want to underline. He was praying to who? Himself. Saying, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I paid tithes of all that I get. I want you to know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out who he's counting on to get him to heaven. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, the sinner. In fact, that's all that any of us really can do is simply cast ourselves upon God's mercy. So if you want to go to heaven today, it's going to begin with the recognition of your own unworthiness and your need of God's everlasting mercies. Amen. That's where it begins. And then comes grace. Now, grace is getting what we cannot earn or deserve. See the difference in the definitions? Mercy is getting what we do not deserve. Grace is getting what we cannot earn or ever hope to deserve. You know what? If we only receive God's mercy... We're still going to be without hope because you and I need what mercy cannot provide. What is that? We need a brand new standing with God. And the only place that you and I can find that is at the foot of the cross where Jesus suffered and died for you and for me. And friends, it was in that place that Jesus paid for our sins. And once that debt was paid, then God was free to give those who believe what we can't earn or deserve. He was free to give us his forgiveness and everlasting life. It's no wonder then that you and I have confidence to come into his presence. So what's keeping us from doing it? What's holding us back from taking time to pray? Well, as I asked myself the question this week, the very first thing I thought of was pride. You know, pride is that attitude that says, I can take care of myself. In fact, I think pride's at the heart of every sin. It's right there at the center of it. It's even in the center of the way we spell the word, S-I-N. And I want you to know today that, that pride 
Pride will keep you off your knees until you are broken by life. What's holding us back? If it's, if it's not pride, it might be unbelief. And while most Christians think this isn't our problem, I'm here to tell you that I think it is. I think it shows up in the very place that you and I would least expect it. And where is that preacher? In our prayers. Think about this with me. The next time that you're in a prayer meeting, in fact, some of you might want to give it a try sometime. The next time you're at a prayer meeting, I want you to pay attention to the kind of things that people pray. Because if, if uh, you hear the kind of things that I typically hear, I'm convinced that a lot of the times, in fact, maybe most of the time, we pray and ask for things that are going to happen whether God gets involved or not, as long as you and I just do what we need to do. I mean, how often do you and I ask for God to do things that are only going to happen if God does them. I think there's a difference. William Carey was a preacher uh, back in the 18th century, and yet to this day, he's still called the father of modern missions. And William Carey once, once uh, said this. He said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. You ever heard that before? You know, if you and I would, would live our lives like that, I think it would make a difference in the kind of things that we bring into the throne room of God's mercy and grace. So the next time you pray, or the next time you hear somebody else pray, listen for the kind of things that are only going to happen if God shows up. And friends, I, I hope that those are the kind of things that you ask for. I hope those are the kind of things that you pray. In fact, let me show you this prayer promise. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. We'll turn past the Gospels, past Acts and Romans and First and Second Corinthians, and then you'll find Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I love the way this passage begins. It says, God is able. God is able to do more than we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations. Friends, when I think about those words, it sounds to me like the Spirit is daring us to pray God-sized prayers. What's keeping you from doing it? Oh, it, it might be condemnation. Condemnation is the attitude that says, I deserve all the trouble that I'm getting. All this Stuff that's going on in my life, you know, the things that are falling apart. I mean, I deserve all of those things because of the way I've acted and things I've said and, and on and on we go. And friends, I just want you to know today that, that when you start thinking like that, you have bought into the very strategy of the enemy himself who loves to heap self-condemnation upon God's people because he knows when you and I carry that kind of baggage around, it's going to keep us out of the throne room. Friends, don't. Don't do it. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. You may want to highlight these verses. They're so good. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. I think that deserves a hallelujah when I think about that. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. He goes on later in the chapter and says, if God be for us, who can be against us? So when the enemy wants you to take on condemnation, don't do it. Don't do it. What keeps us from Stepping into the very throne room of God's mercy and grace, well, busyness. I mean, that may be the greatest enemy of all because you and I are so tempted to so fill our life with activity that there is absolutely no time left to spend with God. No wonder the church seems so powerless today. Many, many, many years ago, in fact, I'm talking about the year 1857. 
There was a businessman in New York that felt led of God to take one hour a week and challenge people to come and pray with him. He chose Wednesday during the noon hour. He challenged businessmen to come and join him in lifting up their city and praying for the needs of this nation. His name was Jeremiah Lanphier. That very first day in September when he met, he spent the first half hour praying alone, wondering if anybody was going to show up. And before the hour was over, a few did. I think he might have had six people there that day. But the next week, he had 20. And the week after that, he had 40. And believe me when I tell you this, because this, this is the truth. Within less than six months, that noon prayer meeting had swelled to 10,000 people who came together to do nothing but pray. And thus began the third great spiritual awakening that affected this nation. And it is said that a million people came to faith in Jesus Christ because those kinds of prayer meetings began popping up all over this nation. In fact, that third great spiritual awakening is the last one we've had in this nation. And I find it very interesting when I'm thinking about it because of the, the time in which it happened. All of that was going on prior to the bloodiest you know, time in the life of this nation, our civil war. As I thought about that great prayer revival, I asked myself, can that happen today? And then I thought, something like that should happen today. Something like that needs to happen today. But it's never going to happen until the people of God decide to make time to step in to the very throne room of heaven itself. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, it reminds us, verse 16, to make the most of our time because the days are evil. I submit to you today that one of the ways that we can make the absolute most of our time is to be sure that we have set aside some time to step into the throne room of heaven itself. And by the way, the Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures is the one making the invitation. And I want you to know as I get ready to close this morning that, that it's more than an invitation. It's a promise. Did you notice? It said, if you and I do this, and we've been told that we can come with boldness and confidence if we enter into God's presence and that, that room where we spend our time praying or any time in our lives when we pray, if we go there, the scripture says that we will receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thought about this passage all week. I just want to say thank you. In fact, I know I don't say it enough, but God, I just want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, I thank you for your mercy that enables me to enter into your presence. And God, I thank you for your grace that enables me to enter into your rest. And so God, today, remind all of us of this. And help us to remember that it's all because of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Satan tempts me to 
despair and tells me of the guilt within upward i look and see him there who made an end of all my sin because the sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me I want to invite you to take your seat this morning and we're going to get ready to come to the lord's table here in just a moment his table of remembrance. Before we do that, as you bow your heads, I just want to give you a few moments to prepare your heart and your mind before you come. It's fitting for you to take this opportunity to thank God for His, His mercy and His grace. If you're here today or if you're listening at home today and you've never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I want to ask you today to look to Christ as the answer. He's the only one who can help you get to heaven because he paid the price of your sins. And if that's a commitment you need to make, trusting your life to him, let me encourage you to do that right now, today. And you can just quietly pray and say, God, I'm, I'm so unworthy. All I can do is cast myself on your mercies. And so God, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And then just give your life to Jesus today. Promise that for this time forward, you belong to him. And he'll save you. He'll save you. And before any of us come to this table, we need to ask the Spirit to show us if there's something we failed to address in our life, maybe some unconfessed sin, something we haven't forsaken yet. And as the Spirit brings something like that to heart and mind, then today's the day to agree with God about it and say, God, I, I'm just going to call it what it is, exactly what you call it, and I need your help to overcome it part of his mercy and his grace. So as you continue to pray, I'm going to invite our, our deacons to come forward as we get ready to observe the supper. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your amazing love that thought of the plan of how to save us from the penalty of our sins by sending your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for laying your life down for us. Thank you for the Spirit's conviction that helps us to know how to respond. And so today as we get ready to come to this table of remembrance, Lord, I pray that you bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. That brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We are healed by our sacrifice and the life that you. Say
was his heart transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. You may recall in the gospel records it talks about that night it was the time for the Passover and it was soon after you know that Christ himself became our Passover he he died in our place he sat there that evening as they were observing that meal he picked up the bread and he took it and he he broke it and he blessed it and he he gave it to them and he said that this bread was his body that was being given for them. They didn't know what he meant at the time, but he was about to lay his life down for them and for you and for me. And then he picked up the cup, even as we do today. He told his disciples that the cup represented the blood of the new covenant. He was about to spill his blood for them. He dried, died in a way that I can't even imagine. But every drop of blood that he spilled was paying for every sin that you and I have ever committed. And so he gave them the cup and he said to do this in remembrance of me. Lord and Savior, I can't express my gratitude for what you accomplished on our behalf. But as we look back today to think about your death on the cross and subsequent resurrection, we thank you for all that you've done and continue to do for us to make our salvation possible. And we pray that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Defender behind me. I'm filled with the anointing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me. I won't fear. Guides me through mountains. 
Father, I thank you because whenever I read the scriptures, I'm reminded that you hold me close to your heart. You've engraven my name on the palm of your hand, so to speak, and I thank you for that. So God, today, as we get ready to leave this place, help us keep Jesus as the center of our attention all through this week, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to turn in your connection card or your, your prayer card or whatever and have a good week. You're dismissed.